Good evening, everyone, and welcome to the February 2024 Nats Chat. I'm Kari Reagan, the moderator of tonight's Nats Chat, which are sponsored by Inside View Press, and we are very uh, grateful for their generous sponsorship. Please check out their book, Great Teachers on Great Singing by Robin Rice. It can be purchased at www.voxped.com or on Amazon. But tonight, I am so thrilled to welcome the dear Joan Melton back to Nats Chat. We are going to discuss breath management strategies across performance genres and hear about her decades of research on this topic. So Joan, welcome. Thank you so much, Kari. It's, it's wonderful to be here and it's lovely to see you. Oh, so lovely to see you. Joan and I uh, have lamented. She did a Nats chat for me in 2019, I believe. And it is the only Nats chat that for some reason the recording didn't work. And it was just filled with so much wonderful information and videos. And so we had planned on doing this again and then COVID hit. <laughs> so it's taken us a while, but here we are, fingers crossed, recording will work tonight. And um, as a very brief introduction to this brilliant woman, uh, Joan Melton, PhD, is a leading researcher in cross-disciplinary performance techniques and a pioneer in the integration of singing and voice movement skill. I have in front of me right now the third edition of one of her books, One Voice, which is fantastic, and we will discuss it in a bit more detail later. But to begin with, I want to ask Joan, uh, as a way to introduce herself to us, a little bit of the beyond the bio, what we don't know about you from reading your extensive biography. Thank you so much, uh, Kari. Yes, the beyond the bio is, is fun. I started <laughs> life as a classical pianist at age three and mm -hmm. uh, played with orchestras and did solo recitals throughout my childhood and youth. I also started studying dance early on. I wrote plays and poems and music, and my, my sister and I were a song and dance team with mom as choreographer and accompanist. So <laughs> putting things together and working across boundaries has been a given as far back as I can remember. Um, mm. I, even my degrees, which are not usually mentioned, you know, they just say she has a PhD, but I have two degrees in music theory, the bachelor's and the PhD, and a master's in vocal performance and the ADBS from the Central School of Speech and Drama, the um, advanced diploma in voice studies. So even the degrees are kind of here and there and, <laughs> and all around. Isn't that wonderful though? But that's where some of the best inspiration in our field has come from is this, the cross-disciplinary approach to things, right? I mean, it's just profoundly changed our field. So I think that you were ahead of, ahead of the game, ahead of the time with those cross degrees. Yes, well, it's, I think, one of the wonderful, maybe the best thing about teaching or researching is that we keep learning, Kari. I mean, every day of our lives, we, we do things, but, but we're always learning. And yep. that is so exciting. I always say to my students, the more I, le I learn, the less I feel like I know. <laughs> I know, of course. <laughs> because it's infinite it's infinite what we have to learn especially in our field i feel that's like right. so right. well and we are changing. we will never yes know. yes that's right we keep learning more well we are excited to learn from you tonight and you're going to lead us away uh with a, a bit of a presentation discussion presentation so take it away with your technical skills now with sharing your screen Yes, Akari is uh, being so kind. <laughs> I have no tech skills, whatever, but she has led me through, and we hope to show two brief videos with this. <laughs> <laughs> the title of tonight's chat relates to, to studies, to uh, exploratory studies that I led 
in the UK and Australia, 2007 through 2013. And so I would like to share some information about those studies and then bring you up to date on the research journey since then. At the time things began with this uh, research in the UK, I was in process of publishing and just mentioning some other things, but putting things in, in, in uh, focus soup. I was in process of publishing singing and musical theater, the, the training of singing, singers and actors. Again, I was looking at how things relate across between acting and, and singing. And this, this has in it interviews with major teachers of singing from the US, UK and Australia. So I have been, I've been going to Australia quite a bit and uh, loved being there. So it all began at RADA, the Royal Academy of Dramatic Art in London, January of 2007, at a conference on performance breath. Ed Blake, our physio and medical, and Jane Gray, both Australian, presented a workshop titled ultrasound imaging of abdominal support mechanisms whilst voicing. I was intrigued. And when I left that workshop, knew I was heading in a new direction. I called, made an appointment with Jane, and it went from there for the next year and a half. To give you an idea of um, what, we, what we saw and where we worked, I'd like to show you a brief video and then we'll talk about things. If I can pull this up and uh, remember how this is done. Um, I'm gonna share my screen and... Like a champion. We'll see here. <laughs> and here we go. For centuries, voice specialists have known that abdominal pressure contributes significantly to breath management, or what is often referred to as support. However, until now, we've not been able to see that support and to know which muscles contract and release when. Wow. With ultrasound imaging, we can observe the specific movements of individual abdominal muscles. For example, we can see that transversus abdominis tends to take the lead in any activity. This is particularly significant. Since transversus is the only abdominal muscle that forms a direct connection with the diaphragm and is therefore capable of controlling the diaphragm elevation. At the same time, the abdominal muscles work together, and at high vocal intensity levels, transversus and internal oblique often work as a magnificent team. Wow. In the following clips, Christopher Simpson, London-based actor and loop specialist, sings a song of his own devising in several different physical positions. As yet, we do not have the equipment to monitor abdominal activity during the extended physical movement. Uh, 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 oh, 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 Joan, before you stop sharing your screen, oh, I was just going to say the sound isn't super great. I mean, we can Ooh. hear it, but 
But I just wanted to know, is there anything you want to highlight for us from what we were looking at with um, from that video? Yes. Yes. Thank you for asking, Kari. Um, because lots of times people say, what are we looking at? What are we seeing? Um, what we found was that the muscles, the abdominal muscles that manage the breath, are the lateral muscles, mm -hmm. not the rectus. That's, it goes along for the ride. And this was known long before I started. I mean, Thomas Hickson talks about this too. The main muscles are on the sides. And the deepest one, the deepest, I'm talking internal, close to the middle of the body, is transversus. Its, it's fibers run horizontally around. And that is the one that has fibers intertwined with those of the diaphragm. Mm -hmm. And so that muscle and internal oblique, which runs this way, is seems to mimic it. And then if I have to say, ah, then this one comes in. If I have to do something big, you know, then we need more. So those muscles seemed to work together. But it's not, sometimes people think, oh, abdominals, and they think here, and they think, right. oh, no, <laughs> that's not going to help anything. So it's, hey, you know, it's, we're up, and it's, it's, it's down here, and uh, it's connected with, with a pelvic floor, but that's a whole other chapter. But anyway, oh. there's that, and let me just show you. You saw this. Yes. These are my, this is my insights and nicely labeled by my, my, uh, the, the photographer friend. But this is looking inward. It's not actually looking down. It's looking in. And this would be skin, subcutaneous tissue. And then the first muscle we see is external oblique under mm -hmm. that internal oblique and then the wonderful transversus in Brisbane we call that the voice muscle and so it goes into a, a V there and if you watch and I'll talk about this the, the ideal way to experience ultrasound imaging is with the probe on yourself because you bear your midriff and you know, if it doesn't hurt they just put a probe about here and immediately you see your insides on the monitor. And you see that transversus moves. It, it engages a split second before you make a sound. And then mm. for the breath in, there is this release. It's just a quick release. And it's, uh, it's lovely. You get the idea immediately if it's on yourself. I can't do mm. that. but. Uh, but you know, if you get a chance, that's great. And the photos that I have, uh, oh, by the way, if anybody is interested in seeing that whole video, I have a link and Kari has the link now. That's the link I sent you. It's about 15 minutes and I'm happy to send it to anyone. There are bits of it on my website under publications, videos, a second video. So and I will put that in, um... Joan, um, of the ones you sent me, is it the one that says Jason Berry? That's, or that's, is what, it the, that's the one we're going to hear next. The, okay, the so it's the you, London clip. Yes, the one that says Tech okay. Core. Tech Core is the one. Okay. <laughs> I'm going to put that to everybody in the chat, not the question box, but the chat box, so people can open that and have that after the chat ends. Okay. Oh, terrific. Okay, so the ideal way to experience it is is on yourself at the very first session the very first session with jane it answered questions that i have had for years about what releases i mean i've been teaching voice and movement for actors for a long time and we'd be in these like we'd be doing shakespeare in a pilates v or a suzuki statues where the abs are very much involved but i knew something would release because the voice was still there and we're doing fine. 
but I didn't know, I would say to my students, I mean, we had, we knew what muscles were there, and I would say something, let's go. I don't know what it is. And the very first session, I saw it, the transversals let go. And um, so that was very exciting to, to see that. And um, it, regardless of physical position, that uh, there, there, is, there is still something that can let go. So in London, no matter what physical position people were in, we saw this same pattern, really the pattern that you just saw with Christopher. We saw, you know, Jane would say, same old, same old. We kept seeing this same pattern. Obviously, those are the muscles, and that's a pattern that the body knows. So we, in London, we had eight professional performers, three of them being very strong singing teachers and some very other interesting people. And then we had two controls, who were Jane and the photographer. Uh, so but they had the same pattern. This is particularly interesting. And there is an essay. There was an essay published in the Voice and Speech Review in 2009 with great photos in it and uh, details about what we did in London. Uh, that is also available. It's on my website on the articles page. And the title of that essay is The Technical Core and the Inside View. Hmm. In spring of 2009, Jane was preparing to return to Australia. She knew I was going to Australia as well. And she suggested I contact Paul Hodges at the University of Queensland in Brisbane. So I took her advice, and what resulted was the first ever voice study in the School of Health and Rehabilitation Sciences. Seven genres, seven vocal genres. This was, this was March through May of 2010. Seven vocal genres, acting, classical singing, Music theater, jazz, pop, rock, and country were represented by 28 professional performers and three researchers from the lab served as controls. In addition to ultrasound imaging and preceding it in the protocol, it was a long protocol and they were hooked up to all kinds of stuff. <clears throat> in addition to, to the ultrasound, there were other ways of, of measuring things. There were recipe trace bands, which you will see in the next video. They are white elastic bands that go across the chest wall and the abdominal wall, and they measure activity there or tell us something about what's, what's the difference in, in those two walls. Then we monitored with surface electrodes, like on the skin, we monitored, there was a probe that went this way to monitor internal oblique, and one that went that way to monitor external oblique, and one that went this way to monitor the rectus. And, okay. and everybody was done on the right side. I mean, it had to be one side or the other, and everything had to be the same. And so that's what was done. Then there's transversus of done. There was an optional monitoring of transversus with a fine wire electrode, the diameter of, hum of human hair, and it was inserted into the muscle with a long needle guided by ultrasound imaging, and it was withdrawn at the end of the experiment. The needle was withdrawn as soon as the electrode was placed into the muscle. I, have, I went through all of this myself before anybody else did it. Both Paul and I went, went through that. Um, so those, those were there. And all of the experiments were videoed at my request. However, as funding was limited and filming was new to the lab, they'd never filmed anything uh, like this before, uh, we lacked the expertise of a collaborative audiovisual specialist. Indeed, what we had was one stationary camera. So 
we didn't get all the things that we would have gotten in London with an expert, but we did get quite a bit. And we were able to see that the physicality was quite different. I mean, we know this already. It's very different. You go to an opera, you go to a music theater, you go to a jazz club, you see differences in physicality because of the, the style and, and all of that. So at this point, I'd like to play one more video. This is going to be Jason Barry Smith, who is a crossover singer, terrific, and he's a teacher. And he sings opera and music theater. And you'll see differences, I think, in his physicality. And here we go. <laughs> you might forget your manners, you might refuse to stay, and so the best that I can do is pray. Luck be a lady tonight, luck be a lady tonight, luck if you ever be a lady to begin with, luck be a lady tonight. Luck, let a gentleman see how nice a dame you can be. I know the way you've treated other guys who've been with. Luck to be a lady with me. Okay. And there, and let me get this going again. You got were it. You able, were you able to hear him? So, so. A, a bit more in the music theater than than the uh, classical, but, but 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 we no 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 it's all right we heard, we I we could hear a bit of it oh, we okay. got the flavor of it yeah oh, well that that has a, a link to in case anybody would like to yes see. so I think you could see even though that things are a little bit different when you're singing opera when you're just singing music theater. And we saw differences in his, in the ultrasound imaging. With the with the opera, it was more you know this it, beautiful um, release and then you know engagement. But with the music theater, it was a little more narrow. It was a, mm. it was a little different looking. It was the same muscles working, but this the shape was a little different depending on what kind of material he was doing. Um, I meant to say earlier that, it just occurred to me, that there is information about these studies in One Voice. And I also want to mention that this book was written originally 2003 with my colleague, Kenneth Tom, who is a speech pathologist, singer, yoga teacher and Feldenkrais practitioner. We went to Cal State Fullerton to join the faculty the same year, 1996, and we have worked mm. together ever since. So I, I always great one for, for Ken. So oh, wonderful. There are a couple of other things that I want to tell you about uh, observations that we made in Brisbane that I think you'll find interesting. The greatest excursions of um, abdominal muscles, that is that wide release for inhalation and, and clean the, the um, engagement for voicing, were in actors and classical singers. Mm -hmm. The much, much less motion was seen in jazz contemporary and music theater and crossover were somewhere in between. Mm -hmm. The populations were not large enough for us to generalize, but likely contributing factors were actors and classical singers often work without microphones. 
Mm. We're used to, you know, being able to fill quite large spaces often. Whereas jazz and contemporary work regularly with amplification. Mm. Also, classical material, whether it's spoken or sung, will often have long phrases. Whereas music theater, jazz, contemporary tend to have shorter phrases. And that mm -hmm. may help to explain the difference in the amount of movement that's necessary, depending on you know, the kind of the style. Mm -hmm. The other thing that I wanted to mention is that with those rest we trace bands, we, were, we saw a pattern of contrast between movement of the chest wall and movement of the abs. We saw that the rib cage seemed to float down gradually during an exhalation, but with the abdominals, we saw that individual abdominal muscles appeared to be directly related, or directly involved with phrasing, with word stress and inflection. There were exceptions to that pattern, but differences were not, as differences were not clearly defined by genre, and in some cases may have been unique to individual performers. More investigation is needed. Near the end of data collection, Paul said, and I'm paraphrasing, he said, perhaps the most important thing we've learned is that performers are not alike, they're different. And indeed, they are. In 2013, I did a follow-up study at the University of Tasmania in Launceston with seven young actors representing every level of the acting program. An ultrasound component of that looked at abdominal muscle activity in tasks that involved movement as well as voicing. Hmm. But that's a quick overview of the work in the UK and Australia. And here's what's happened since. By 2014, I was back in New York working with dancers and music theater, uh, music theater students and, and, and professionals as well. This book, Dancing with Voice, a collaborative journey across disciplines, with a forward by Mary Saunders Barton represents this that period. Then in 2019, also in New York, with wonderful colleagues, Zach Bradford, who is now in Brisbane, and Jessica Lee, who is now in Seoul, Korea, there were two acoustic studies. We, we um, investigated professional actors doing classical material without microphones in outdoor theater. And in the second study, we worked with classical singers doing spoken dialogue in opera. Articles about those studies are in the Journal of Voice, 2020 and 21 respectively. And the last study, the, the latest one, 22-23, was with professional actors, singers, and dancers from a wide range of genres. And we were looking at voice movement skills and how they are used in all, of, in all areas, but differently from theater to music to dance. That project is going to be written up and, and so forth. It has been, but I'm, I'm writing another book and that will be in there. But that project is very interesting. It took the form of a pilot and two auxiliary studies, each two weeks in length, with before and after videos for reference only, a 90 minute voice movement class, two individual sessions, and a very open discussion on the last day. We had a Wagnerian soprano who said she totally reversed her, she turned upside down the way she prepared right from learning to, to performance. And her videos were very interesting. 
The first one, it, it was beautiful. I mean, I appreciated the sound of her voice very much. But with the second one, I was totally with her in the scene because the drama had come in, so the, the movement stuff was there. Um, two more examples, and then we can open it to questions. There was a young music theater performer who said, child's pose was a game changer. That's a yoga position, you're down on the floor like this. He said there was something about that relation to the floor. The voice just soared. And then this, I, yes, 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 yes. That's child pose, you got it. Yeah. And uh, thank you, Kari. And then you're welcome. there was a brilliant dancer who's now beginning to do music theater. He said, you go to a ballet class and it's an hour and 45 minutes without making a sound. You're very pulled up and quite vertical the whole time. Then to be able to let the ribs flare and relax the stomach, to have those two ways of functioning has been really helpful. So, you know, there are lots of examples, but uh, it's been wonderful what's happening with everybody connecting with everybody else. So mm. that's my but, little feel, and I'm happy to love if there are any questions or take it any direction at all. I love it, but I, and I love that you're still you're actively doing more research. You you feel there are more nuggets to be garnered, obviously. Yes, yes Kari. I it was wonderful. You know, you can talk to these methodologies and hope it is the right thing. This one just worked like a charm, and I think it could be used again and again and again and again with different groups. You're going to find out different things. Mm -hmm. They learn over a two-week period, and they all get together. And even though we talk about integration, in academia, there is still a lot of isolation. And mm -hmm. so for singers to really get a chance to talk to, to dancers and actors and find out more can be very, very valuable. It opened a lot of doors to even those mm -hmm. three two-week periods. One of the things that I've always found interesting, and it's been coming back around, uh, you know, Thomas Hickson's book, right? Yes. We just all love mm -hmm. that. Such an extraordinary yes. resource. Yes. Um, but, but this idea that even though we teach a certain way and we work and work on breath management strategies in studio, everyone ultimately, the strategies that they come up with aren't exactly what we are teaching and there's something so heartbreaking about that and yet i trust that the strategies that i'm teaching are helping them to then let their body organize itself in a way that works for them and we know that to be the case because their sound improves and feels more efficient but i think there's a, a, there's something disheartening not disheartening isn't the right word but i feel like people come to learn about breathing for singing from me yeah. And yet, at the end of the day, I know that their body is going to organize and find a strategy that hopefully yes. uses those. Oh, you have really, you know, I almost went down that path. And I thought, no, maybe it'll come up in a question. Here's what, here's my theory that makes us not, we can't, nobody's going to do it exactly like we do because our body is different from, from theirs. <clears throat> what we saw, you see, we saw the same pattern with all controls, with all performers in London, with a majority of them in Brisbane, and with some of the physio vocal work that we did in Tasmania. We also saw differences. And like the dancer says, I can do this, but I can do that. And so as teachers, I mean, what I feel and all we can do, as you said, we, we give the best we have, but I allow people to find what their body is, is doing. I mean, I may ask them to lie on their belly on the floor and make noises and see what they feel, or go to um, a position like here. Uh, if you're, I was going to say, you know, uh, uh, uh. Uh, you know, put them in positions where they're going to feel this, just so that, yeah, so that they know what their bodies 
can do. And then we, we've done, I think it's important. I think that's a, it's a kind of neutral. It's something the body will do on its own. It obviously, I mean, all the controls had that same, that, that same pattern. And so just having them know that, but, but not say, oh, if you do that, it's bad. You have to do this or it's not good. But we have all kinds of things we do as actors, singers, dancers, and we may need to do something different. And mm -hmm. that doesn't mean that what Kari taught you is wrong or that, that everything a dancer does is wrong. No. We've got amazing bodies. It has mm -hmm. this, this thing that can do it on its own, but if you'd like it to do something else, it's really smart and can learn it. Mm -hmm. so, I love that. <laughs> we we have a wonderful question. It's long, so so everybody bear with us. Ian Howell has asked, could you please talk more about your findings regarding the interdependence between ribcage suspension and abdominal activity? Uh, he says, I have also explored and mentored several studies using respiratory inductance. Oh my gosh, Ian, what is that word? Plethysmography, forgive me everyone, bands. And one of the really interesting findings is the nature of how abdominal contraction can act, doesn't always, depending on experience, as a driver of ribcage expansion. I think it's somewhat, uh, it is somewhat revelatory to know that we don't have to lift our ribcage in certain ways of breathing, it lifts. Absolutely, absolutely. Thank you, Ian. I mean, there's a lot there. We could go, we go a lot of directions, but I mean, just very simply, if if you put your hands on the lower ribs and you use the app, hey, hey, I feel my ribs going out. And so a lot, if, if things are working well there, this is just open. And then depending on what you're doing, I mean, there's rib reserve that's still used in, in some ways. And whatever it is you, you have to do, this kind of, of, of abdominal action can help to keep you open. In other words, it can serve you very well. I almost am never aware of the, of the ribs anymore. I mean, mostly I'm, I'm not working in, in classical singing so much, and I'm, but I'm not trying to hold. It's, it's just that when you're working underneath, this tends to stay nice and open. So, don't you find that's one of the the most difficult things to train in classical singers? Be, the the idea of like the flexing of the ribs, and then I call it the buoyant maintaining of those ribs because I don't like the language of keeping your ribs out. I so I call it buoyant, buoyantly maintaining. So, right. but that is that is contradictory to how our body biologically works. So I find that to be one of the most challenging aspects of our you know uh, right. approach to balanced breathing do you have any thoughts on that i no i mean uh i think some people have more trouble with that than others mm -hmm. one of the things that that i have found very helpful and this relates to the accent method that's you know it's going a, another a direction but the accent method is very well known, it was developed by Sven Smith in Denmark a hundred years ago, and very well known in the UK and Australia. Awesome. But just not, it, what it does is teach us that that partial vacuum that occurs in the lungs brings the air in and we don't have to worry, worry and work for the in-breath. But there is a, um, there's an exercise that I use lots of times at the beginning of, of a class uh, I didn't invent it, but I sort of worked it out. I call it jogging sound. It's not really jogging, but you are moving about. And every time you, you step your foot down, you are blowing breath out, and then you change it to sound. But it's allowing the body to sound rather than predetermining. And if you have a class, you can improvise and so forth. But it's something like... And we go along for a while. 
and finally, you know, we stop and I say, why do you think we did that? Um, and one of the things, one of the reasons I do that is to dramatically show that the body knows how to breathe in. So it kind of frees us. Here we are having fun and we're not having to worry. We're just using, it's using the breath out. That sort of relates to uh, what, what you were oh, saying, keeping this open. It, yeah, so how do you find that balance between conditioning the actual motor skills that we need, as, again, especially in classical singing, but in all genres, how do we teach those motor skills while not getting our clients too rigid in those motor skills, right? By do we can't, to, in my opinion, we can't just go to the play that you're talking about because there is a motor skill that needs to be taught within those respiratory muscles, in my opinion. And yet there's, to me, there's, you just, the pendulum swings between the two and then play and letting the body organize itself in yeah. the kind of exercises. So do you feel, do you feel, I guess what I'm asking is, do you feel it can be taught simply through play movement and those kinds of exploratory things like you were just doing? I think that whatever exploratory stuff we do, and it is one, I'm glad you said play, because I think we need that other side of the coin. We need the play. Yes. But, but we also, <laughs> this comes from the disciplined pianist. We must learn the technical things that we must be able to do, to sing, to do whatever it is. And we right. must work on them every day of our lives, or we're not going to be the performer that we that we want to be. So we can do things on the one side of the coin that helps us and keeps us free. At the same time, we've got to do whatever Kari said I needed to do in order to do this piece. So I, I think being a performer, I mean, sometimes audiences have no idea. They just think, oh, she's talented. No. <clears throat> <laughs> There's a work that goes into it, daily work, in order to be free enough to do whatever it is, mm -hmm. in order for it to look like, ha, I just toss it off. Ha, yeah. Mm -hmm. So only because I, I think that, you know, whatever it is you are teaching them, Kari, it, it takes a certain appreciation. Yes, I just mm -hmm. do that. But I can also do something else. You don't want to get tied up. There, there may be, there may be some of these, uh, the exercise things. I mean, I have people down on the floor and all of this sort of thing, and and moving around. But all of that is done neutral and very, very, very free. If there are times when they have to do something that doesn't feel so free, as long as they understand that you know, there's two sides to the coin and they have to do both. Mm -hmm in order to, to be what they want to be. Um, I, I realize it may be difficult, but, but we've got to have both. It isn't just I that- I so appreciate that. that. Right. Yeah, I, I, we are very much aligned in that. Yeah, I, th I think that both can be useful, but I do have all, I know with voicing, we hear a lot about, of course, at some point it has to be coordinated with phonation system the breath right yes. but i i do believe that the muscles in fact that we just saw on the ultrasound the skills the specificity of what's required of those muscles in my opinion can some of that can be taught separately because that the activity of those muscles must be acquired and yes. then coordinated so anyway i yeah there's many and, ways to get a cat of course yes we saw the same actions in controls that we saw in pros. What's the difference? The pro knows what she or he is doing. The, you know, the, 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 uh, it's, it's, the body knows it, but we as performers must be specific, must know exactly how to use whatever it is. I use the story frequently, Tiger Woods, 
at the height of his career, changed his swing 10 times, three times in 10 years. Uh-huh. When he, uh, you know, when he was at the height of his, his game, he still continued and lit- apparently completely re, uh, redid his swing three different times in a decade. Yeah. I find that fascinating. Yeah. You could- it is. It is. Look- and, that, and, and perhaps that's the time to do it. When you are, you know, <laughs> so much, you have so much experience that it's actually mm. easier. It's like mm. my, my ballet dancer who is like, okay, I can do that. Whereas somebody who's just, you know, lower down on the, with the experience might not be able to do it so easily. The same mm-hmm. thing happened, a similar thing happened with a, a jazz singer who was having problems, a very uh, high experience. And it didn't take long for her to switch things around. And she was so happy about it. So, yeah. I love this question from Janine Dodd. With all your research and acquired knowledge, how do you approach breath management with beginning singers? So for all our voice teachers that work with junior high and high school or our undergraduates just beginning, you know, how do you take all this and pare it down in a way um, to approach those initial lessons? Um, Everybody, all of us teachers have to find our own way with things, of course. I can, what I can do is uh, I can share what I do. I, you can say, I wouldn't do that, or maybe it's that, you know. So, I work now, well, I worked a long time with grad students and even and with first year students. I like working with that, that wide split, but I learned a long time ago that working with actors, they need to be able to sing. They need to know that they can sing as well as speak, and many of them are terrified. I, and this is not, you teach classical singers, but you never, I mean, in a, in a class, you, you could have anything. But I have a, this is in one voice. I have a routine that I teach that has worked for a lot of years. And it teaches this, you know, this abdominal stuff and freedom and so forth and they are on the floor i don't know whether i can yeah but they're sitting on the floor and they can sit anywhere they want to and i have them do i start low and you know i have a piano and they sustain notes Mm, and they're moving their mouth, so everything is, is not hard, but mm, and then they let the tongue come out on the lip, you know, the, mm, and they go down, and then they go five notes down and down, and then they change that to e i e i e i e i that kind of thing, so that they're letting go of the jaw. And you see, I mean, you have to get into a lot of things at the same time. And on the mm-hmm. floor, they will tend to tap into what the body does. Anyway, so we do some a bunch of stuff on the floor. And then, so I'm working on legato there. And, you know, really connecting. You need that in speech, too. We have people who stop before every vowel, and uh, that needs to be corrected in speech as well. And then I have them start on all fours or back. Going, going toward child's pose so that, that they're helped by gravity to let go of the abs. And we do, we do arpeggios starting on a G below middle C and um, just like ma, ha, 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 ha. And they, so they get that going, their belly's going and they're, they're, it's more comfortable down here. And gradually they're getting up and by the time they're up high, they are moving around and going down for the high notes can be very helpful because it tunes into that. Um, this <laughs> so I, I use that with a class and I often use it with um, 
other people as well. It's great with dancers because the worst thing I, I have been told that that a dancer hates being forced to just stand at attention mm -hmm. and sing because mm -hmm. they're afraid of singing anyway. Maybe they haven't had any voice, and so if you can let them move too, then mm -hmm. then that's helpful. Uh, so it's getting another thing. I'm throwing out a lot, but I do, after I do that kind of work, early on, I mean, like with a new student in a new class, I go through the movable parts of the vocal tract. Mm -hmm. This is really, really important. Actors don't know. They think they have this voice. Well, yeah, but they can talk like that, too. I mean, they can do all kinds of things, but they don't know it. And I also coach in outdoor theater, which I show lots of Shakespeare, no microphones. And one thing that's really important, in addition to having the abs under them, is having a similar shape in the vocal tract to what you have as a classical singer. You're doing classical material. And mm -hmm. you don't do it like that. You don't do it. You've got to have space. Otherwise, it's not going to care, and it's not going to sound right for what you're doing. So I go through <clears throat> this. I got from the Estol work. I did all the Estol stuff. It, it, I I don't teach the Estol, but I got some things from it that was that were that were important. So you know, they find out their their language moves up and down. It's not going to hurt them. But that if they're going to be a classical singer, they want it. Uh, fairly low most of the time. Why? Because they need lots of resonating space. And they also have a soft palate. And so we talk a little like that, and then we lift, and then we lift, and then we lift, and you know, we find, oh, oh, I can do that. And then I have, I have a pharynx, and I can start like this, and I can open and open and open and open. And you know, we find they have movable parts that they can use. Wow! And um, that's news. It's great for an actor, and it's great for singers too, to know that they have more than one way. To, to do things. So there's that. And then I will share something that it, it, it does come out of research, but it, it came out of my observation. Mm -hmm. um, a lot of people who teach actors are not musicians, and, and you know, they have started singing. But I was one of the first of the Fitzmaurice people, I mean, I've known that work before, since before it was a method. I met Catherine in, in 1986, and when I was doing some of those uptown, that there's you know the feet over the head and all that, I thought, oh, it's so easy to make iPhones here, wow! And I thought, oh, okay. And then if I was doing a yoga thing and I was in for a dog, oh, 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 so easy to make those things. Now, that's interesting. And so anyway. I play with that, and I ask Kenneth, you know, when I have a question, I ask Kenneth because he, he knows a lot about this sort of thing. And he said, well, you are, when you are like this, you're shortening the vocal tract. I said, yes, but when I'm like that, I'm, I'm not shortening the vocal tract. He said, yes, but the strap muscles are letting go. And it makes it, yeah. yeah. I for you to make those. So mm. I use that sort of thing too. I'm sure that we all, you know, we use all the things that we have found to be helpful and yes. nobody does it all. Mm -hmm. I don't know whether that's been useful or not, but that's... Oh, goodness, thing. yes. Well, I mean, it's interesting with all your years of, of research that where you've landed for years in, in your application of that is movement through movement and voice exploration or sound exploration which yeah. is very interesting yeah it uh it is here's what happened kari i was teaching at cal state fullerton when i was teaching it at uh, uci i was told that i must not one day i was caught uh, teaching the grad students, and I had they had been singing a little bit, and uh, I was told, I said, "Were you teaching singing?" And I said, "No, we were just on specific pitches." And you know, I said something, and oh, okay, you're not allowed to do. And you know, when I came from London, 
people were afraid of, of anybody who was a musician because it's, actors are not supposed to sound beautiful all the time. Well, I know that. Uh, no, <laughs> I can teach you to sound bad too. But um, anyway, uh, at Kelsey Fullerton, I, somebody called and said, okay, this person is doing polygata in, in um, under Millwood, and she's terrific, and then she has to sing, and she falls apart. Can you help? I said, sure. And so she came over, and I, I worked with her, and she got through it very well. But I came late to class a minute, uh, just a few minutes later, my grad class, and I, I explained. I said, I'm sorry, I was working with somebody uh, to help her. And one of the more mature members of the class said, Joan, that's what we want you to do for us. <laughs> And I never again taught a voice movement class without singing, being a part of it. Yes. So, you know, and I have, I have people you know, they're singing on the floor and they think they can't and they wind up, you know, one of the first articles I wrote was, was sing better, work more. If an actor can sing a little bit, you'll get a job that you wouldn't mm. get. Mm -hmm. yeah. Bringing, bring, as we come to the top of the hour, bringing uh, full, full, full circle here, I want to ask one question about this research. You know, we know the, you know, the six primary muscles of exhalation and two of which are the transverse and obliques uh, and then uh, uh, the rectus abdominis, which of course yeah. we don't want to talk about because it tends to do this if we activate that. But, you know, I'm old enough from that generation where teachers would say, imagine zipping up your pants that are too tight, right? Which is right along the rectus. So I'm curious, knowing the direction of the fibers of the obliques and the transverse, yes. um, does that change how you teach exhalation when you get into the specificity of that at all? Does that, does knowing the direction of the fibers change versus how we often were taught with that zipping up? Um, it doesn't change for me. It doesn't mean I'm not saying that it shouldn't. But I had a question, Kari. I was confused. I was reading Thomas Hickson's book, um, the one that I, I mean, he wrote others, but he, yes. was, describing, he was describing the, um, the internal obliques and, and, and external, and all of that. And he was saying things that were confusing to me. Hmm. And I wrote to him. And, and there are people, let's see, what was it? He, well, anyway, he said that it's like playing a violin. You have to hold the violin up. You have to have something to work against. There was, there is at least one, person that are thinking that says you've got to just use transverses because it does what it's supposed to do and and uh and not let the others move but they know how to work together and what what thomas hickson was saying is that if they work the opposite direction still this upward thing takes over, it's stronger, and it actually is good. It needs to have something to work against rather than just going mm -hmm. So um, this was, <clears throat> I, I, I can send you, I have our conversation, it's been a while, but. Oh, I'd love to read that. He, cause yeah, he's, oh, lo he's no longer with us. I never got to, you yes, know, interview he, him or. Yes, it was December the year before he passed away in the mm. spring, that this conversation took place. And it was just, uh, it helped so much because I thought, oh, yeah, yeah. and it, it, what he said to me is, don't worry about it, the body is smart. <clears throat> oh, yeah. I love that. Uh, <laughs> let me, I'm, I want to take a moment because Rebecca Windham has asked a question. You mentioned something earlier about the lower abdominal muscles and the back muscles or perhaps other muscles which wrap around the front and are working in concert with the diaphragm. And you sort of demonstrated in your arms wrapping around your waist from your back. Can you talk a little more about that and also how back 
disorders such as scoliosis or even chronic back pain would affect that and how to work around it for effective breathing for singing? The transversus runs horizontally. That's what I'm saying, that it runs around. And it's the one that, that interdigitates with the diaphragm. And that's the one that seems most important in breath management. It's the one that seems to lead the way. Um, I hear you about back problems because I've had them myself and you know still deal with that uh, every day. I I mean I don't deal with um, I simply get this working and do physical exercises that are helpful to me. I find getting the back like I do a, a full plow and shoulder stand and all of that stuff every day of my life. Um, and just keeping yourself as, as mobile as possible is very, very helpful. And mm -hmm. I'm not a doctor, so it, all I can do is, is come from uh, my own and, and experience with students and so forth. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Keeping you, well, thank you. Listen to your own body and don't be afraid of your own body. Mm -hmm. it's, um, it's it's wonderful. It will find sounds for you. If you're working on a roll, you know, find the body and let the sounds come out of whatever it is. I love that. What a perfect way to end that. That was a brilliant segue uh, to wrap this up. And I, I want to just thank you so much for your enthusiasm and all your decades of research and dedication. Thank you, Joan, so much thank and for so sharing much, it. Molly. It was wonderful. Yeah. You're wonderful to be in your energy, which is great. Oh, she is so kind. You're very generous. I want to remind everyone that our next Nats chat will be March 10th, and we will have Michelle Marquardt DeVoe and Sarah Campbell. And we are going to talk about the business of voice studios. She said, and the title is You Aren't Your Voice Business. So I will hope you will join us March uh, 10th for that. And with that, I will wish everyone a wonderful evening and hope to see you again. Thank you again, Joan. Thank you. Bye-bye.